My name is Olivia Sarah Lelacheur and I work for AIA Australia. We are the sponsor of the report that we're going to discuss today. Um, AIA sponsored this report because um, we believe in advisors, um, we support advisors and we have participated in an industry that's gone through enormous change in the last few years. And we felt it was really important to work with Dr. Adam Fraser and Deakin University to draw out the experiences of advisors like yourselves. Um, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the research today. Um, we know that financial advisors provide a, a crucial service to ensure that Australians are assisted to make positive financial decisions to safeguard their futures. Um, less recognised is the role that financial advisors play to support their clients in a time of need, um, such as following a job loss, um, a change of personal circumstances or the unfortunate diagnosis of an illness or injury. Um, these circumstances can be very emotional and very difficult um, and, and financial advisors help their clients navigate these circumstances. So we need financial advisors to be as resilient as possible so that they can guide their clients to making informed decisions at times like this. Um, as I mentioned, all of the changes in recent years have certainly placed additional pressure on advisors and um, in, in recognition of that changing environment, this piece of research is critically important not only for advisors to understand that they're not alone in the way that they're feeling, but also to allow us to showcase publicly and particularly to um, our friends in the regulatory environment, um, what it is that financial advisors are feeling, um, how they're working uh, through a, a, a backdrop of enormous change um, and thriving to find ways to do what they absolutely love to do. So, um, I want to uh, reassure you that there is a really positive note to this research. Uh, there's examples of people who thrive uh, against this environment of change, and we do want to share um, those facts and those concepts with you today. Now, in today's session, uh, we have an hour together. It's an hour of CPD-able points, uh, and uh, in about a week's time, you'll get an email from the AFA with that CPD point information. Um, I would ask you all to stay on mute during the duration of this particular webinar, but I do invite you, if you've got some questions or some comments that you want to pose, please use the Q&A function. Please don't use the chat function because we're going to be monitoring the Q&A function. So now let me hand over to our very special guests um, who are the stars of this webinar. Firstly, the AFA president, Michael Novak, and Dr. Adam Fraser, who is our researcher uh, and the author of the report that we're talking about. So I'm gonna hand over to the two of them to have a conversation about the research. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, and thank you, AIA, for your commitment and support to financial advice and financial advisors. Thank you to Dr. Fraser and, and Deakin University as well for doing this uh, significant research which, which is extremely uh, extremely timely. Um, this does give an accurate account of the lay of, of the land in, 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 the, in the world of financial advisors and it is very timely. Uh, the AFA this year is celebrating our 75th anniversary. We've been supporting advisors and the value of advice for 75 years uh, but we haven't, I, I don't believe I've ever seen a, a situation as it is today where the, the I guess the well-being, uh, the mental state of financial advisors has been so low. Um, this, this research does give us a voice. Um, as, as Olivia said, it gives us a voice with the politicians, with the government, with the regulators and the public so that they can understand uh, I, how, how advisors are feeling right now. But it also, from an association level, it gives us a chance to better understand how our members are feeling so that we can better support you. And this is one of the main reasons, or this is the driver for this, uh, this webinar today. Um, so I wanted to, um, I just wanted to acknowledge AIA again um, and, um, and welcome Olivia and, and, and Dr. Adam Fraser. Uh, today, what I'm gonna be doing is, is talking through this research uh, as an advisor, I am the national president of the AFA, but I also am a practicing advisor uh, based in Brisbane. So I, I too have been through a lot of um, the, what, what this report outlines um, in terms of my emotional state, and my well-being. So I can relate to this report uh, personally. So um, let me get on with it. You don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from, from Dr. Fraser who compiled all of this research. Uh, Dr. Fraser, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Now, I know you're not feeling 100%. So um, yes, uh, it's ironic. We're talking about well-being, and I've woken up with uh, 
some sort of stomach bug that uh, is, is hampering my ability to stay upright. But um, this is a very important conversation to have. I much appreciate you conducting the research uh, and, and also sharing it with us and being with, being here today. Um, if you do need to take some time out, please let us know, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Oliver and I can can uh, can cover. You know, this we might have to take an intermission. Yep. Yeah. Look, I'd just like to start by just a general overview question. Can you give us a high level about, I guess, the reason for, for doing this report um, and, and a, a bit of detail into the processes so that we can understand. Um, how, this was, how this was done, the rigor. Yeah, well, where it really started is I was doing a keynote presentation for a, a dealer group and I was talking about some of the research we'd done in the past and a group of advisors literally came up to me and bailed me up during morning tea and said, uh, you know, the research you've been talking about that you do with other groups, you need to do that with us. And I, I asked the question, why? And they said, well, we're not coping. And they talked about all the pressure involved in the industry. They talked about the like tragic suicide rates that had happened. And, um, you know, I, I went away from this conference. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Uh, I stayed in touch with some of those advisors and we started to map out the study and I brought Deakin University on board. And then what we were looking for is someone to fund the research and uh, we met with a number of groups and um, you know, some of them showed interest but wouldn't really commit. And we met with AIA and basically I didn't even get through the first sentence and they said yes. They said, if this is gonna support the wellbeing of financial advisors, we'll, we'll get behind it wholeheartedly. So I think it shows how truly aligned to their purpose AIA are, so yeah. Um, and now, in terms of the research, what we started to do is we did two studies. One was a, a survey that over 700 advisors filled out, and that measures various psychological constructs. And the second part is we decided to look at a group in much more detail. So we looked at 44 advisors. We got them to fill out diary studies. We did interviews to really understand where they spend their time, how their well-being is, um, and yeah, so they're the two parts of the study that we did. Thank you. Uh, this, 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 the research itself, was, I found quite confronting uh, as an advisor. Yeah, um, you know, looking at uh, page 52, um, state of advisor wellbeing, 73% of advisors had experienced high level of burnout. 33% of advisors had sought uh, medical care. 67% um, of advisors had experienced some level of depression. These are horrific and confronting uh, statistics. Uh, and, and, and when I read this, it, it really knocked the wind out of me. Um, yeah. In my own personal situation, uh, I just wanted to relate. I, I think it was my lowest point as an advisor was back in 2019, just after the, the Royal Commission uh, report had been uh, handed down. And, and, and I feel that the the breach in trust, the, 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 the media um, messaging really, really, I took personally and it really, it really, you know, really, really quite hurt me and dented my confidence as an advisor. But then also the rapid change that came out of that, the rapid regulatory change in terms of changing of fee structures, all of the, the education requirements, um, I, I found quite confronting and difficult to deal with. Um, I, like, I'd like to try and, um, I guess, get an idea of, a bit of an outline of, of the overall statistics from, from this. I'm, I'm relating this to my own personal situation, but it seems like there's, there's thousands of advisors out there experiencing the same thing. Can, can, can you elaborate on this in, in your research, um, please? Yeah, well, as you were saying, some of those things, the stats are incredibly concerning, you know, that 73% of advisors are experiencing high levels of burnout. So it's not just some level of burnout, that's high level. Uh, you know, a third are seeking medical advice to deal with the stress attached to their job. Um, you know, poor sleep, 61% of them are experiencing uh, challenges with their sleep. And 67% are experiencing some level of depression from a little bit of the time to all of the time. So what this shows is really you have a group of people that you know, we, we have serious concerns about their sustainability 
and can they continue doing the job, but also, you know, that their well-being is suffering terribly. So, I mean, it, it is it is very concerning, and and for it, it, an industry that's very important to the public, like it's critical that people have proper cover. It's critical that people have, you know, good financial advice. This this is an important job, and it's a it's a group of people that are finding it hard to stay in the job. It's almost like the what's going on is 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 eradicating the industry. And there was three big things that really affected the, their well-being. Number one was just all the changes make it very hard to do the role. Like it, it's it's very demanding. It puts a lot of pressure on them. It takes a lot of time. All the regulatory restraint constraints. The, the second one you alluded to as well is, is how they're being painted in the media, how they're being judged. Um, and that one really hurts. Like that, I, I think what we haven't paid enough attention to is the impact of that on people. It's, it's deeply wounding and scarring for so many advisors who work so hard, who have so much meaning and purpose attached to what they do to have this like unfair appraisal or this criticism of them out there in the marketplace. And the third one was just around the fact that many of them feel that this process has been done to them. Like they haven't, it hasn't been a consultative process and it hasn't been, well, let's work together to make this industry better. It's much more, well, you guys are out of line, so we're going to come in and we're going to impose all these things on you. So those three things have had a, a dramatic impact on their mental health, their well-being, their desire to stay in the industry, the amount of fulfillment they get from the role. So they're the three key things that we really found in our research that's having a devastating impact on this group. Thank you. Uh Another issue I, I, I saw in the report, and we, we can elaborate on maybe some of those a little bit later, but another issue on the report was uh, looking at the, the, the task ratios, and I think they're on page 17 for those who, who have the report, um, and, and looking at the high level of, of compliance and admin tasks now that advisors were doing. I was shocked by that high level, but yeah. to be honest, I, I can relate to it completely. As an advisor now, we're, we're spending so much time on... On, on admin and compliance issues that are taking yeah. us away from what we love to do is helping yeah. people getting in front of clients. Um, can you can you give us a bit of insight into to, to what you found there? Because I really feel that a lot of advisors would just say, I, I relate to that completely. Yeah, well, I think you summed it up really, really well. I mean, 30% of their time is spent in admin and compliance. And what they talk about is that it just takes up so much of my time and energy. Now, like obviously from a business perspective, if you're having to spend that much time, you know, you, you're not doing it, you, you're not spending time in, in revenue generating areas of the business, which makes it hard to be successful. But also, I mean, one of the biggest things we discovered is how much meaning and purpose advisors find in their role and, and how important they think it is to people. So what they really love and what lights them up is interacting with clients, giving them advice, helping them out, supporting them. And because of the regulatory demands, it drags them away from that. So there's multiple sort of ripple effects of that. One is that they don't get to do the part of the job that they love the most. Secondly, is that all the regulatory demands really drain their energy and their enjoyment out of the role. So while they still find a lot of meaning and purpose and think it's important, their enjoyment of the role is diminishing. And the third one, and this is something that advisors talk about a lot, and actually you, you could probably give far more insight into it than I can, is what they're saying is that because of the regulatory demands, there's many clients like sort of lower value clients that they're, they're unable to help as much because it just costs them so much money. 
So these sort of um, clients that have less uh, money to invest and, and, and aren't as wealthy, the amount of admin time it takes to help them, it's, it almost like diminishes their business. So they're having less opportunity to help the people that really need the advice the most. Like, do you understand what I mean? Oh, completely. Uh, yeah. that, that was one of the issues that I had to confront. And I am uh, back in 2019, it was making the decision, realizing that we weren't, I wasn't able to, as a business, to, to, to cost effectively help um, those type of clients because the, the, the requirements from an ongoing compliance point of view just yeah. prohibited me from being able to charge, I think, a fair value fee. And it yeah. was having an honest discussion with those clients. Oh, the way I dealt with it was I just need to have an honest discussion with each of those clients and say, this is the reality of this is the situation. We can go forward in two ways. You, you can become a reactive client whereby you let me know when you need me and yeah. then I, I can help you then and, and do a fee-for-service style arrangement or I, I, I move you up to an on, you know, a higher level of cost uh, ongoing fee arrangement. And that's very difficult because in, in our business, we've, we've been going for, for over 50 years. I, 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 it's a family succession business. My, I felt that my dad made a commitment to look after a lot of clients over a long period of time. And some of those have, have gone on different journeys with us, but there was still a lot that were in that old model that mm. I wanted to show, I wanted to show, uh, give them that dignity and show them that respect and show my dad you know, make, make sure I honoured almost his promise there. So it was very, a lot of emotions. It was a very difficult decision to make. But I guess yeah. what we've got to do as advisors is just control what we can control and, and assess what's in front of us and make those decisions and try and do it in a way in which we can, I guess, maintain our dignity, but also, you know, provide our clients. Yeah, and that was something that was universal across all advisors of, I really want to help these people that need my help, but yeah. to do that, it actually diminishes my business and it makes it incredibly hard to do that. So if we look at the regulatory landscape, if we really want to help Australians that need the help, like changes have to be made. Most, most definitely. And, and that is one thing that the AFA is doing working with the government to say, and you can see some really good signs coming through with the new chair of ASIC saying that we need to ensure that there is an accessibility and affordability. Yeah. So that is one thing that we're continually working uh, with the government and regulators on. And it's a message that they are hearing. We just need to make sure that we, we play that through because I know that uh, all of my advisor peers and friends, they just don't want to serve that the high net worth clients, they want to be able to serve Australians that need, yeah, advice. And, and, and we should be there. The pendulum has swung too far. It needs to swing back. So I completely yeah, and, agree. And as I was saying before, um, the advisors are saying that some of the most fulfilling experiences as an advisor is helping those um, lower net worth people to start to have better habits and turn their life around from a financial perspective. Yeah, and it can take time. So that's where the value of an ongoing advice relationship yeah. is. You don't always change people's mentality and their habits and, and, and the way they do things with one piece of upfront advice. Uh, most people need to be managed year in, year out. And I find a lot of the times I see the biggest changes about, in about year three. Yeah. Once you've been able to have a couple of reviews, monitor the client and say, look, you, you're going well in this area. Um, you're not going well in this area. How can we change that? And they finally get it when they can see their mortgage going down, for example, by a, an extra... Um, you know, couple of, you know, extra couple of ten thousand, twenty thousand, twenty thousand dollars a year because they're managing their cash flows better. Yeah, um, yeah, and one of the things about you guys that you do really well is that behavior change management and and mm. people's relationship with money, not only cognitively but also emotionally. Exactly, exactly, and it, it um, like I said, it does it, it can take time. It's something you can't just flick a switch uh, mm. and, uh, and 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 change. Um, you know, and I, I guess a lot of advisors as well in terms of life insurance, uh, we are being, just because of the high cost to provide it, we are being restricted or, or, or moved out of that low, uh, that low premium market because of, um, just because of the cost. So I think that is one thing that advisors are really, uh, really concerned about because we, we believe that, you know, we want to service, you know, all, all Australians in this area. It's what a lot of AFA members do so well. Uh, and, and you, you Claiming on life insurance is something you can't predict. It, it is just, it, it's something that happens to, to some, some not to others, but as advisors, we, 
we want to be there to help people when they need us most you know, at that time of claim. And uh, it just doesn't seem fair that we're not able to, um, you know, because of you know, it's a changes to, to, to commissions or, or, or the um, uh, what we're being paid and the high compliance costs, we're, we're not able to serve that market. So it's something that I know is weighing on a lot of advisors as well. Yeah, and someone who personally, I've had a couple of friends have some tragic and traumatic experiences and I've had some that had insurance and some that didn't and mm. the ones that didn't have insurance are just in a devastating position. So the yeah. peace of mind that, a, like for example, a trauma policy provides to somebody who needs some, some, some major medical, suffers a critical illness and needs some major yeah. um, medical care, the peace of mind and the dignity it provides them. Uh, it, it, it's, as an advisor, when you assist someone there, you just see the, the, the difference in the, ben the difference in the client's psychological state uh, and the benefit that it does play. Yeah, and it really does come down to that collaborative relationship between regulators and and the industry to, to come up with well, what, what's going to serve both parties best. Yeah, it, it does. It, agreed. And it, like I said before, it is something that the AFA is placing a high priority on. Mm. Uh, and we look forward to working with the new ASIC chair to, 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 to identify those ways. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to, to go back to... Um, uh, to those task ratios, uh, you mentioned that advisors who you know, value being in front of clients, helping clients, um, that's what gives them the, the reason to for, uh, I believe you speak French, don't you? <laughs> um, but reason to be. Uh, and I, I find, like, I have quotas in my business, how often, I, how many client meetings I have a week because that's what I'm there for. That's my role. That's what I enjoy doing. And if I'm not in front of clients and I'm doing this admin work, I get grumpy. Um, I'm in a lucky position where I've got three staff that can help me. Um, I wanted to get an idea of the, the thrivers because the thrivers um, you identified were people who are or advisors that are, that, 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 are, that are coping, that are doing quite well at the moment. And you've given, the, I guess you've given some characteristics about um, what they're doing. Um, and I just wanted to, I guess, get you to articulate uh, a little bit more on the thrivers, but also the difference, maybe highlight how their tasks, um, the tasks that they're doing are, are more client focused or, or more, more engagement, probably better, better way to say it, they're having more time and engagement with clients. Yeah, so what we, I mean, just to give people a heads up, we, we discovered a group within the advisor you know, of the advisors that we looked at that we called the thrivers and their characteristics was that their business was growing and evolving. They were innovating, they were improving, they were embracing new ways of working, uh, but also they had really great mental health. They had really great well-being, good work-life balance. And um, one of the things we found out about them is that they spent 43% less time in admin than people who weren't thriving. Uh, compliance, they were doing 97% less time on compliance. So what they were doing was setting up structures and support around them where other people were taking that off their plate and they were outsourcing that uh, so that they could spend more time on advice and growing the business. Uh, they were spending 34% more time in client meetings um, 83% more time finding new business. So they were really, you know, setting up structures and systems around them to take that regulatory load off them so that they were spending more time in areas that they really enjoyed, but also that allowed them to grow the business and evolve it. That's, um, so, so a key thing there was having the, the back office support within their businesses yeah. to take away those compliance and admin relating task, admin related tasks. Yeah, and a key mindset we found of people that weren't coping had that mentality of I have to do it all. And that, you know, it's up to me and they just kept yeah. holding on to everything rather than empowering others to do it. Of letting letting go of those um, thirty dollar tasks in a way from a from a yeah. commercial point of view and trusting somebody taking the leap to trust somebody to do that so that, that you could be better spending your time doing the you know three hundred dollar advising tasks. You're exactly right. Yeah. 
Um, in terms of, was there anything else psychologically that the thrivers, just so we can give um, those members or, or those advisors on the webinar today a little bit of understanding about how these thrivers, their mentality, is there anything from a psychological point of view that they, um, they displayed? Yeah, I mean, look, there was, there's a really big one um, and it's called psychological flexibility. And it's, it's going to be hard to describe, but actually, I'm wondering whether can we, you see this, um, the flip chart paper behind me. Might need to raise your screen a little bit higher. Yeah, we, we can see, not, I think, most of it. So, um, whenever we've, let me describe it this way. Whenever we're just faced with some sort of challenge, right? So we have some sort of challenge in front of us. And can you read that all right, Michael? Can you see that? Challenge? Uh, kind of. Let me grab another marker that's a little bit thicker. So whenever we have some sort of challenge that we face, so we come up against some sort of challenging uh, that's good. experience. So it could be that I need to evolve my business. It could be I need to put in some sort of new system, right? So in response to that, we can choose a towards behavior. And that is a behavior that helps us overcome that challenge and deal with it. In contrast, we can choose an away from behavior. And that is a behavior that stops us taking on that challenge we procrastinate, we avoid. So one thing we know about human beings is that the stories we create in our head and the emotions we feel about that challenge influence whether we choose a towards or an away from behavior. So does that make sense so far? Yeah. So if we, um, you know, if we want to improve our well-being and we want to start exercising, you know, towards behavior is we start to do new, better habits and away from behaviors, we stick to our old habits. And we might have a story that, oh, I'm not an exercise type person or I'm not, you know, uh, I don't have time for that. And it, those stories and emotions often drag us into these away from behaviors. Yep, so does that make sense? Cool. Yep. So what we thought is if you look at the evolving and changing our business. So the challenge that advisors are facing is that the regu regulations have changed. We have to um, you know, spend more time in different areas. So that's the challenge they face. So what we found is the thrivers were doing much more constructive behaviors to help them deal with the regulatory shifts. Whereas the people that weren't coping were kind of doing destructive behaviours of avoiding the, the education standards or avoiding changing their business, they're stuck in their old ways. What we expected was that the thrivers would have a different stories inside their head and different emotions about the regulatory challenges. So that they might think, oh, well, this is actually good for the industry or this is, you know, this is a, a, a good change. What was most fascinating about our research is that all advisors had the same story and emotion about the regulatory environment. So they all felt that it hadn't been implemented that well, yep. that it wasn't um, a consultative process. They were all frustrated by the change that was happening to them. But what we discovered about the thrivers is that they could have this story or emotion, yet still do really constructive behaviours that helped their business evolve. So when, when they looked at the regulatory landscape, they were still frustrated by it or felt that it wasn't the best, uh, wasn't implemented very well. Yet they were able to go even though I'm frustrated by this or this is this makes me angry, 
I have these very clear goals that I want to achieve or, or here's the best thing I can do for my business. So even though they felt and experienced this, they were still able to do really constructive behaviours. The people that were struggling got so caught up in this story and these emotions that it hijacked their behaviour and they often did dysfunctional things. So it wasn't that they had a different story. It, the thrivers were able to feel the frustration or or be angry about what's going on, but they're almost able to put that to the side and focus on the, the goals and what they want to achieve in their business. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. It, yeah. It, 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 it's it, it, controlling what you can control to a degree. Yeah, and, almost. Yeah. yeah. It, it's almost yeah. that thing of, yes, I'm, yes, I wish things were different. Yes, I wish that these regulations would change or yes, I wish that, um, you know, this was a more consultative process, but this is the reality of what I'm facing. And in that reality, I'm going to choose these constructive behaviors. Whereas people that weren't thriving were almost so, so overwhelmed by that emotion and that frustration, it started to run their behavior rather than, well, here's what's important to me or here's the best thing I could do for my business. Yeah. Okay. So, so how can we, this research, uh, what, what does it tell, how can we help those that are struggling in, in that phase? Um, there's going to be, if we see so many advisors leave, uh, there's going to be a shortage of, of, of advisors to service the you know, demand in terms of people looking for advice. We all know, we're all believers, we all know how much of a difference advice makes, um, yeah. you know, provides to the public, to Australians. Um, how do we support those that are struggling at the moment and just not sure of whether they want to go on? Like, we want them to go on. The AFA wants you to go on. I know you do. I know Olivia yeah. Once, once these advisors stay on, what learnings do we have from this research um, to help those people? Some, some practical tips to say, hey, maybe you should try this or, or this. Um, yeah. yeah, so I mean, for people watching this, my advice would be, no, one of the challenges about this psychological flexibility is it's not like, here's the, it, it, it's a quite a complex skill. And one of the things we're doing is putting together at the moment, we're designing uh, like a, a training program to start to teach people what these uh, thrivers are doing. So we're actually going to putting together a, a training program to teach people how to do this. So number one, you know, from practical perspective, people watching this is number one is just be careful of Am I getting so caught up and lost in that frustration and that story that I've created about this situation and what's going on, that it's, it's kind of running my behaviour rather than, well, am I focusing on the things I can control and do I have really clear goals about my business? So that's the first one. The second thing is that, well, one of the other things the uh, thrivers did really well is prioritize their well-being. So they looked after themselves instead of they they did things like they were physically active, they were practicing relaxation and mindfulness to cope with the stress of the job. They were also able to, at the end of the day, turn off and be present with their family or friends and have that time to decompress at the end of the day. Um, one of the other things that they also did really, really well was engaged in industry support. So whether that is with through the associations, because you, you know the associations do some really proactive, great things. Like are people tapping into that? So what we found is that the thrivers really tapped into it, as well as they spent time collaborating and spending time with other advisors and getting insights and ideas from it. Um, and also one of the other big ones, as we talked about before, was leveraging their time. 
So, you know, finding ways to outsource that sort of those activities that anyone could do uh, and free them up to spend more time on business development, seeing more clients, trying to get new business. Um, so they were the really big things that the, the Thrivers did differently. And it's been a bit different. The COVID overlay has made it a little bit more difficult for advisors to engage with their communities, uh, especially face-to-face, -face, given the fact that we haven't been able to, you know, conferences were missed last year. We haven't been able to run you know, as much statewide events, some yeah, states yeah. better than others, but that has created a bit of a barrier um, as well, you know, on, on top of all of the, the changes that have been happening. Um, uh, I, I just want to... Um, go through, uh, I guess, some of the ways in which the AFA is looking to support our members. And, and one thing that we've done uh, a, a few years ago when, when um, Phil Kewen joined as, as CEO, he said, one thing I want to do is provide support to, uh, to uh, our members, uh, wellbeing yeah. support. And he brought to us uh, a program that uh, from, from, from Benistar, who, who the AFA then partnered with. Um, they're one of the most uh, large providers of employee support. Um, this support is free to AFA members, their employees and families, 24-7, uh, free of charge, confidential. Uh, so if members do feel like they do need somebody independent to talk to, um, please, um, please reach out and, and look at that. Um, we're also looking to, as, as we uh, move into a, a post-COVID world, uh, we are looking to have more events. Um, some states are doing some great grassroots engagement in terms of the FASIR exams. We know that um, some members prefer just to engage within their own community to, to, to talk to others and, and, and that's really helping um, them to, uh, to work through and, and, and take the challenge to get this exam uh, or take on this exam and, and, and get it done. Uh, there's some great support within your, your license, licensees. So advisors looking for support, um, please, ask your licensees what they're doing. Uh, we know so many are doing so much. Um, we're also seeing uh, some of the uh, product providers, you know, such as AAA, yeah. this way. Some of the others um, are running, um, other companies are running uh, tell, uh, for CEO masterclasses and things like that. So there is a lot of support out there. Um, if you need something, just please call the AFA and, and, and let them know where you need some help. Um, and we will be able to support you or, or let you know where we can support you. Uh, AFA is, is, is run by uh, all of the state directors, uh, our advisors. So we have a very uh, high advisor input and influence. Uh, and there's, um, we will be able to get, get some help to you or support to you um, at, at a local level if, if you need that. Um, yeah, and can I just build on that? Like one of the things we found about the Thrivers is that they were much more proactive about talking to people around their challenges and reaching out. Like we had, you know, a number of them had formed little groups, like network groups where they turn to each other for support and, and almost like mastermind little groups where they get together and um, periodically and talk about here's my challenges or here's what I'm struggling with. And as a group, they would talk about them and talk about solutions. And it's just that, I don't know whether it's an Australian thing or a really masculine thing, but we tend not to ask for help and we tend not to talk about what we're going through. And what we found is people that were really struggling were the ones that were less likely to reach out for support. Whereas the, the people that were coping were had almost this regular practice of, yeah, I turn to people and I have a chat. And when I'm, when I'm not feeling very well, I reach out to either a colleague or a friend or, you know, some of them talked about, you know, I go see a psychologist and talk about some of the challenges. So one of the very, you know, if, if you look at our data, one of the really strong findings was that these thrivers regularly sought support and regularly talked about, you know, I'm struggling with this or I'm, or I'm, I'm finding this difficult. They were incredibly proactive, whereas rather than they, and what, they didn't wait until they were in this terrible state before reaching out. And during this research, you know, I spoke to a lot of people in associations and, and 
and uh, dealer groups who said, well, we're putting on these services, but people aren't accessing them. And, and yeah, I don't know whether we have this like BS story in our head of, you know, we're weak if we, if we ask for this, but um, it's, it's an absolutely critical thing that just verbalizing, talking about it, getting a different perspective is, is a really healthy uh, thing to do. I have to say, um, in my own experience, that, that's what I did. I, I reached out to those advisors or industry peers close to me. Um, so I guess if there is a message we can today, it's if you are, um, you know, if you're finding it difficult to cope, please take that first step to reach out and, and potentially it's, perhaps it's better just to someone close to you um, that, that you can have that discussion and, 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 and just, you know, start that conversation. Um, yeah. And also so many of the things that the associations provide are anonymous, like, you know, you, no one's going to find out about it. It's, it's, and even just a conversation to verbalize of I'm struggling and I'm not sure why, but yeah. just that ability to start to articulate and, and explore what's going on for you is like, there is nothing more important than that. Yeah. AFA, AFA care program. It, it is there for, for our members. Yeah, it's brilliant. I like, I, I, you know, in preparation for today, I looked at it, explored it. Like it's a, it, you know, very high quality service that that advisors should be tapping into. I guess another message I heard from you today is is those members that that maybe see somebody that is struggling, perhaps you can just take the take the time to give them a call and, and see how they're going and, and proactively reach out um, to, to 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 see if they're okay as well. I guess. Yeah, and that one of, just to reiterate, one of the things we found about the Thrivers is they, they almost set up, some of them did it really formally where once a month they would get together and have breakfast and talk about, you know, this is going really great in the business or I'm struggling with this, that regular check-in almost. Um, and whereas others would do it a bit more ad hoc, but they would, they had this sort of, little tribe or little posse that really supported them. And one thing we found in our data is that there was this huge correlation between the more you were struggling, the less likely you were to tap into industry support. And that's an incredibly concerning finding on our behalf. Like, it sh I mean, it should be the opposite. If you're struggling, you should be tapping into. So it's taking that first, that first step yeah, I think that's important. Uh, having read this report, it just made me feel this this sense of we're all in this together. Uh, so it, it would be if we are able to create an environment where we all, as advisors, we all are looking out for each other, supporting each other, uh, taking taking steps that maybe we would not take usually, mm. uh, being a little bit braver just to to, to reach out to others. Um, we, 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 we can see ourselves get through. I, I mentioned this before, but you, it, it's so, for advisors that aren't coping so well right now, but, but you do want to stay in, uh, please, please reach out. We want to see as many advisors get through the next phase uh, and continue on their advice journey because Australia needs you. Uh, the association believes in you. We, we want to see... Uh, you know, and many advisors come through so that we can service that 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 that, that need for financial advice, that life changing advice that that we all give. So, yeah, Michael, I think a really important message we need to give right now is just if you look at the thrivers, one of the things that was most fascinating about our data is that there's no set demographic group that they fit into. Like we couldn't explain them by type of business, level of education, how much experience, gender, location. Like there was no sort of demographic explanation for them. What it came down to was in the individual person. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, and the, the characteristics that these thrivers had are teachable. Like you can teach psychological flexibility. You can teach like being more adaptable and open to change, um, you know, looking after your well-being, 
uh, leveraging your time, engaging in industry support. These are all things that anyone can take on and start to practice. So it's not like you can have the mentality of, oh, well, it's okay for this group because they have this situation or it's okay for that group. That's not the case. It's literally what makes advisors thrive is a, a, a series of behaviours and skill sets that are readily learnable and teachable. So that's the good news part of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fraser. Ke Ke Cameron, um, Cameron Byrne, the head, head of partnerships at the AFA, has jumped on. That's our cue to, uh, to go to Q&A. So we've got to stop that. <laughs> Thanks, so. rambling on. Uh, Cam, have you got any um, uh, questions uh, on the Q and A? Yeah, so, thanks, Adam, and, and thanks, Mike. And Mike, I don't think it's rambling on. I think this is a very important topic that you know, as as wealth industry advisor professionals, we could talk about all day. So, yeah. it's, it's very insightful. So, a few questions that are coming through. Um, I think that some of them have been covered off, Mike, and I know you've raised AFA Care, which is a very a very valid uh, support service that we offer here at the AFA to our members. Um, so that would cover one of those about talking about how families have coped with advisors. Um, so I think that's important because it is open to families of advisors to, to talk to. And I think, as Adam said, and, and Mike have it's both um, agreed, it's, it's, an, it's an anonymous service. And I think that's very, very key that don't, don't be afraid to put your hand up and ask for help because yeah. you know, it's anonymous. We at the AFA do not get information on any of the conversation or who actually contacts. Um, it is open to staff as well. And, and, and we do, there is an app as well to which you can get some tips and tools, right? Yes. Yeah. I think Neil McDonald has, has raised a good, good point that, you know, Adam's survey accurately reflects the experience we've observed based on their member feedback at the association. So. Yeah. It's, it's consistent, this feedback across the whole industry and the report is very valuable. Um, there's a question around isolation and unsupported. I think that's been covered off with networking, AFA care. You know, talk to your colleagues, talk to your peer groups. Um, Reach out to, 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 your, to your AFA community, local communities or, or even your state director. That, that's myself. That, that's what we're, we're here for. We're, we're here. We know how challenging this is. We are here for our members. Um, I, I know I speak regularly to some, you know some of my dad's friends who, who are get a chat, have finding it challenging to get through for for their exam. Um, it's as an association, I believe that we really pride on our community spirit, and um, we, we're here for, for for any members that, that that need to that you know need some support or just need to need to pick up the phone and chat. Yep. Question here, uh, Mike, what does your research show that advisors need the most from their professional association? Is that, did that, was that a standout question or response in the research, Adam? Um, what we didn't actually ask that. Um, so, you know, we don't have a, a specific answer to that. I mean, I think I, <laughs> Looking at what the association's providing, you know, the AFA care is a, a brilliant strategy. Um, you know, it, obviously it provides professional development and help. When we were looking at it, it wasn't so much that the association has to change what they're providing. What we more found is that more advisors have to proactively engage in what's being provided to them. That, that would be my answer to that. Because, you know, we, we looked at what you guys are doing and it's, it's, it's bang on. It's, 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 um, it's incredibly helpful. It's just more people need to tap into it. What we're hearing from our members, thanks. Adam. What we're looking at is the simplification of the compliance firm. Uh, we, we completely, as a practicing advisor, I completely, you know, understand that and agree with that. And that is where the AFA is placing a lot of our uh, priority and resources in doing. It, it's, it, it's trying to swing that pendulum back. Uh, we're hearing that it's just too costly and too compliance burdensome at the moment to, to serve clients. So we're very much looking to do that. We, we, we've been able to share with you that the, the, the AFA care program um, uh, as well. We're, we're looking to try and support as many advisors through the FASIA exam uh, so if that is somewhere where you need support, please contact us and we can find out where you, um, you know, where we can target or tailor uh, that support. Um, 
as well. That, that's a that's a good point, Mike. And we do have a not that it, this is an a, a advertisement, but we do have a, a FASIA webinar coming up in coming weeks. So please uh, make sure you look out to this one. This is a this is a very. Um, Can I just add one more thing? I can. So it, it, respectful communication was something else that was raised, and and uh, I hope many of you have seen that the AFA call out. Um, uh, the, the, the words that was shonky advisor phrase that was used um, in parliament last week and, and the AFA feels very strongly that enough is enough um, using financial advice as a political football or kicking us around like that yeah. um, those days are over we're, we're going to take a stand now and uh, we, we hoped to really create a, a movement there because I know Phil Anderson um, our acting CEO was not happy about those comments last week um, so that is something where we, 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 we are looking uh, we're demanding some change from the government there. Yeah. yeah, and that was deeply wounding, as I said before, to advisors who pride themselves on the, the role they do and the, the impact that they have. When they're referred to like that or beaten up in the media, that, that wounds them and it, it, it hits them hard. Yeah, it does. So sorry, Mary, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Adam. Um, further to Mike's comment, you know, Phil Anderson... There's a question around the latest dialogue with the regulator with respect to the understanding of our issues. As all of you would know, Phil Anderson is high, a highly respected professional within the industry and a subject matter expert. And, and him and the AFA board are in constant dialogue with regulators, pointing out these issues, as Adam's just rightly said, you know, calling advisors and the profession shonky advisors. So please rest assured, as an association, we are very mindful and taking the task to the government and the regulators, the story and the good news story that you uh, as, as members and industry professionals do take to the client. So one comment, or sorry, one question I, I really want to call out, and this is a, a really um, emotional question. And, and who, to whoever has put it forward, I, I strongly suggest that you, um, you know, reach out to AFA Care, you know, utilize the service, um, you know, I have attempted suicide in late 2019 and I'm still working as an advisor. I find it hard to remain motivated. I'm reaching out to others and trying to stay motivated, but is there anything extra I should be doing? You know, I, I think, you know, it's utilising all the support services that, that we've spoken about today, you know, connect with your, your peers, connect with close uh, industry colleagues that, that you deal with, talk about it, have open dialogue. But please, can I can I stress to you the importance of reaching out to AFA Care and talking to a professional um, as an independent person? I, I just, I can't put a value on that. I can't stress that highly enough, given that comment. And I, I really do sympathise um, with that particular person. And I, I would really encourage you to, to, to take extra steps you know, to, to talk to other people and to really engage um, to make sure that you're, you're looking after yourself as a, as a very key priority. Yeah, I mean, that person definitely needs to go engage a professional to, to support them and manage them. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly a psychologist, um, also, you know, a GP as to whether they need a referral to see someone about... Um, where the medication is is a step forward, but that person needs to really take that seriously and go engage in in a number of health professionals to guide them forward. That, that's because obviously that's an incredibly serious situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and please rest assured, you know, further to Adam, you know, we as an association are behind you 100%. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here come in. Uh, is there any chance the minister and the opposition spokesman have seen or will see this? Um, I, I understand that the report has been shared. It has. Like, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, you know, we can't highly stress the value of the AIA and this Dr Adam Fraser report, and we are doing everything as an association to distribute this to the parties that really need to understand or have a better understanding of the industry and, and how the, the impacts of change are really affecting our members and those in the greater industry. We, we can send them a, 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 a link to this webinar as well. We're also looking, I know um, 
AIA has publicly released this research. It's got it's got a lot of press. We're also looking to to to, to leverage that as well in, in a lot of our releases, etc., uh, to ensure that the, that the message uh, is getting to to the public uh, and, and the politicians, the decision makers, and the influencers. Yeah, one of the key things that when we met with AIA and we talked about this project is one of the key things is we wanted to have an influence on the regulators and get them to really understand what's happening and, and, and the fallout of some of the decisions that they make. So, yeah, this is something we're really trying to drive is that, uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff has been anecdotally talked about in the industry, but we wanted to put hard numbers and, and, and rigor behind um, w what we think is happening in the industry. Given the uh, that we're running, starting to run out of time, any questions that we haven't covered off, we will cover off. So please don't think they will be or they have been ignored. So we will cover them off and circulate them after the, the webinar has concluded. But I'd now just like to pass back to Olivia um, to close the webinar out. And I just, you know, again, want to stress the importance and the great work that Adam and, and Mike have done during this webinar because every one of us has been able to take something valuable away and, and as a key learning of and the next steps of what's required. I yeah. think Olivia. And just as we go to Olivia, I just want to thank uh, you guys for this opportunity. Also, I want to thank AIA who were incredibly supportive about getting this research up and running and also moving forward, we're in the process of designing a, a program that addresses some of the things that we've learned in this uh, to share some of the skills and, and teach advisors some of the skills that we've learned that really help. Thanks, Adam. And certainly on behalf of AIA, can I say it was, um, it was our pleasure and privilege to be able to work with Dr. Adam Fraser and with Deakin University to conduct this piece of research. Um, we were both shocked and heartened by the outcome of the research because it really gives a voice um, to how the advisor community is feeling. and. Um, I just want to reassure everybody who's on this webinar, this is not your last chance to talk about this research and to engage with Adam. Um, I, I introduced myself at the start of the session as being um, a, a representative of AIA. I'm also very lucky to be the, um, the AFA National Conference Chair uh, for 2021. And we've been working very hard on the conference program, which will come out on the 5th of July. So I encourage you to make sure you look in your inboxes on that date to look at the program and to see when Adam's session is running. Adam will be joined by uh, a number of the advisors who he has classified as thrivers. So you'll actually get to hear from them personally and directly about what it is that they've done uh, to be able to uh, be prosperous um, in this environment of enormous change um, and significant challenge. Uh, so please register for that conference. If you get the chance to read the report in full before the conference, um, we'd certainly love to hear your questions um, and ideas um, and, and your personal uh, circumstances to share with Adam during that session. I did also want to pick up um, that Adam talked in the research about the fact that many advisors are driven by purpose. Uh, you're all here because you want to help people live a better financial life. Um, and that's a strong driver to push through the most challenging of times. Uh, at the national conference this year, we are going to announce a very first type of award called the Great Advice Award. And we're doing that because we want advisors to nominate and share stories about the powerful and positive impact that financial advice has had on the lives of their clients. Uh, that means for the people who are on this uh, webinar who are advisors, don't be shy. Share with us the great work that you do because we wanna showcase this. So not only do we wanna share uh, the, the research that we've talked about today with politicians and regulators, we wanna share your why, what you do, the incredible outcomes that you deliver. And we want people to speak very positively about great advice, great advisors, um, and change the narrative um, that Mike talked about earlier, which Phil, our acting CEO, has been doing an incredible job of um, bringing back into a much more positive tone of voice. So a couple of things for your diary. Um, put the 22nd and 23rd of September in there for the national conference. It'll come to you virtually across Australia but also we have social events in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth. So you're gonna get the chance 
to celebrate 75 years of the AFA. Uh, we're hoping that there'll be some members who might have been around since 1946. Uh, and, and so we can celebrate not only the great journey that we've been on collectively, but also commit to an incredible future together, delivering great advice to more Australians. Thank you for your attendance and participation in the webinar today. It will be recorded uh, and placed on the AFA website, so you can check it out anytime you like. Um, but can I bid you farewell and wish you a happy end of financial year. Thanks everyone, bye.